The Pew Research Center conducted the largest focus group study we've ever done on Asian Americans. We conducted 66 focus groups of 18 different Asian ethnic origins and also in 18 different languages to really understand in their own words, what does it mean to be Asian in America? Identity is multifaceted for everybody, depending on many contexts, depending on who is asking the question, depending on what stage of life that person who is sharing about their identity is at, and also it depends on where they are. For our study, we particularly interested in how people think about their racial and ethnic identity. Asians living in the United States is very broad, diverse group. You have the largest groups, um, Chinese Americans, Indian, Filipino, um, Korean and Vietnamese and Japanese Americans. But then you also have other groups that are, are smaller in terms of population size, Cambodian, Laotian, and Hmong. And you also have very different geographies. So South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia. So all these different geographic origins um, make up what we all call by shorthand Asian or Asian American in the United States. The idea of identity is something that people always thought about. But in our focus groups, some of them had to spend some time to articulate that. So the challenge is not about who they are, it's about explaining to people who they are and then trying to explain it in a way for a non-co-ethnic person, someone who don't share their cultural heritage, to understand. And that's also something we heard explicitly from some of them saying that, I know who I am, but it's hard to tell them when they don't even know where my country is, geographically speaking. I think I straight up just identify myself as a Chinese American woman. I think it's very important to mention the fact that like where, where my parents are from, where, um, who I am, and then where I was born, America. Uh, when I came to the U.S., I was five years old. And I remember feeling confused. I remember feeling which one is my home because I was young enough that I didn't really remember my a full experience of being in Laos. Uh, but I also remember thinking, I don't fit in here. And as a young child, it was just very confusing. Am I Lao? Am I American? When I was growing up, I felt definitely Chinese. And, but I felt I was Chinese American because I was born in America, but I felt that others didn't see me as being an American born Chinese. They saw me as just being Chinese. I, I would say that having lived overseas, American is, is first and foremost my identity. Theo tôi, thì dù sống ở đâu thì tôi vẫn là một người Việt Nam. Mặc dù sống ở Mỹ đã vào quốc tịch nhưng tôi vẫn là một người Mỹ gốc Việt. À, à, theo tôi thì các cháu sinh ra ở Mỹ và lớn lên ở đây thì các cháu uh, có một cái lối suy nghĩ Mỹ nhiều hơn Việt Nam. I identify myself as a sick American and uh, when it comes to saying that sick American, I bring my sick values and then I adopt the American system, American values, and I combine them together into a good human being and a good citizen of this place, which I have now started calling my home for 20 some years. When I talk to people, when I first introduce myself, I definitely say I'm, I'm Hmong and I'm, I'm a Hmong American woman. I think it's very hard to detach to separate Hmong and American. When it comes down to it, I might say I'm Hmong first actually, but I would say that I carry both of those contexts context with me. And I think also being a woman is very important to me because as a woman, it's very different also in the Hmong community. Sometimes it's even hard to explain to other Asian Americans how I feel as an Asian American woman, you know? And when I see someone, I have a friend who's actually Chinese and um, talking to her, we're so close, but even trying to share my experiences is difficult because our experiences are not the same, even though we're perceived as both Asian American women, right? It was our uncle that actually moved to part of the South Arkansas really. along the Mississippi River. Then as the 
uh, laws changed because there were too many immigrants coming from China. They started uh, limiting it to professional people and merchants. So some of our families started coming over as merchants and they would work in the grocery stores. And um, my uncle had started a grocery store with several other Chinese. And then my uncle started having my father and his father come over and they came over in the early 1900s. Mother, John, her son married Toki. Mm -hmm. I was born here in Hollywood, California in 1932. My father was what they call a Gidayu teacher. They're, they do the chanting in the kabuki plays. They had a group of people, an all-girls kabuki troupe, um, and that's where I met Toki. We lived in what you call a um, yellow ghetto, everybody called it. Um, my father used to read and write English, so he was pretty good. But my mother uh, never learned, so our first language was Japanese. So you say, oh, I'm a Chinese-American, I'm a American. I think I haven't got to that point. So I gave my own name, I'm just a Chinese-American in America. 中国人，我觉得这样的就是也尊重美国，也尊重我的国家中国，所以我就是我觉得要彼此尊重，彼此了解了以后，我才能要成为那样的人，还不是，所以那我觉得我只是一个住在美国的中国人。So for foreign-born Asian Americans,、um, which is the majority of Asian Americans living in the U.S., we heard, you know, the identity that they left, where they the or where they originated, whether they're coming from the Philippines. India,、um, China, that identity is important to them. It's meaningful. And then coming into America, they're kind of negotiating what does it mean to be them in America. I left Pakistan for to come here to live, to make better lifestyle, make better to earn, make better to living. I, I drive a cab, but. But I can earn is good money. I have a seven daughters, and、uh, I just、uh, want to bring everybody here so I can make all this money for the daughters on from the cap. Most people want to come here, so I think is my big achievement to come in the America. ขยมยีจุนจีขมายให้บานคืออันต่อเวียนทั้งมอดอลอเมริกนี่กาปีปอนปรางเออขยมยีเนยบองปอนหนึ่งสลกนั้นเกี่ยวกับมันเราในยูหายแต่เกี่ยวมากาปูเออจิมเลฟีปอดเนาะสำหรับขยมหรือกอย่างไหมโอ้ขยมอเมียนลอยจราจรเต้วัวขยมจิกกะเนยถือเสกะสกอคืออ๋อได้ขยมมอดอลจวนอเมริกนี่ขยมในซาลุยแต่จัดสปรามเดลไลเดี๋ยวยังมาดอนนี่ฮะไอ้ basically was born in h o s h a r p u r a place in Punjab the northern Indian tip、uh, you know near the border and、uh, I started there started working there in a travel agency business and my I was basically working with my uncle the best idea came to my mind was to come here for studies So I joined、uh, the Northern Virginia Community College because he was settled in here in Virginia first. So I, I came to him, and、uh, ended up working with a travel agency instead in Washington D.C. area for a kind of wholesale agency there. So for Asian Americans that are originated from the Vietnam War, so those who are Vietnamese American, those who are from Laos, Cambodia, as well as、um, and who are Hmong, we really heard from the refugee-oriented、um, Asian Americans that. They didn't plan coming to the United States. It was out of they had to. My family is also, you know, a family of refugee immigrants.、Um, because a lot of people, when they perceive me, they think of me. Okay, yeah, she's an Asian American woman, you know, modern minority. She's up there. But then I'm like, no, you know, like my parents, you know, lived a very different life from what you might think.、Um, and so I try to, I try not to gravitate towards the narrative of. I'm just an Asian American woman. I think that obviously I am, and I really like that about myself. But I I want to distinguish the fact that I'm a Hmong American woman,、uh, 
um, from a first generation family, um, from a family who, you know, fled like a war torn homeland. Um, I identify as that first and foremost are those three things, long American woman, yeah. Well, I would say I'm thinking about myself as a Hmong American. The majority of Hmong were able to uh, ad adjust it to uh, the, uh, the American way of life. But the older generation, they don't. They just feel like, well, I'd like to go back to my country. But then there's no country. I think of my kids being American because they cannot go back to Laos and say, I am Hmong. Because uh, they don't speak the word of Hmong, but they understand what that is. But they cannot say anything back. Tôi rời Việt Nam năm 1983, um, qua Mỹ năm tôi 17 tuổi. Um, sau, khi chiến, um, sau khi chiến tranh Việt Nam chấm dứt được uh, 8 năm, uh, lúc đó tôi học trường trung học thì uh, thấy rằng sống ở dưới uh, cái xã hội cộng sản thì thấy rằng không có um, học hành mà cũng không có tương lai thì uh, gửi tụi tôi đi ra nước ngoài để có cơ hội học nhưng mà khi mà quyết định gửi tụi tôi đi như vậy thì mẹ tôi và anh tôi không biết được rằng tất cả những khó khăn và nguy hiểm trên đường tụi tôi đi tụi tôi buồn lắm tại vì uh, lúc đó tụi tôi còn rất nhỏ còn sống trong gia đình nhưng mà với cái quyết định như vậy uh, thì tụi tôi đi À, thì lúc đó anh tôi nói với tôi rằng tôi còn hai đứa em thành tự ra muốn rằng hai đứa đó nó phải được học do đó quyết định anh là đi nhìn lại cuộc sống thì tôi thấy rằng uh, khi tụi tôi qua tới đây tôi cảm thấy uh, hạnh phúc và cảm thấy rất là Um, cảm ơn khi đặt chân tới đây ở ít nhất là um, cái hố của gia đình tức là của anh tôi và của mẹ tôi. So from the focus groups of Asian Americans, especially those who just immigrated into the United States, we heard a lot about the challenge, the language barriers, right? For instance, just to use healthcare, right, to be able to go to the hospital, you know, and it's, and it's scary. We heard a lot of fear from some of our focus group participants, um, not knowing what to do. What <laughs> ដល់ពេលដល់ ดอยខ្ញុំជិះពឹងផ្នែកសមាគមនឹងជួយបកប្រែហើយខលហ្នឹងអីដឹងទៀតហ្នឹងសូមមើលអ្វីនោះគឺទីងវាត់ទៅអ
are also living in the U.S. for decades, just like Chinese Americans. Uh, and one of the most important moments is the, their experience during World War II. And so those experiences are an important, essential part of their self-identification, and that also forever shaped their connection with Japan, kind of different from other participants' relationship between U.S. and their country of origin. Uh, I was uh, nine years old at the time, and um, we, my sister and I were coming home from a movie theater, walking down um, Beverly Boulevard. And um, she started noticing signs on the telephone posts. So we stopped and read the signs and it says, notice all Japanese Americans in this area have to be out of this area by uh, a certain date. It was about a week. We just saw signs on the wall, you know, uh, at the store and everything. The people at the store used to say, hey, we're gonna be evacuated. And so I think my parents got a phone call from someone saying that you have to uh, get rid of everything. You're gonna have to leave home. So a lot of things we had to bury because like I said, the FBI was looking for something to connect us with uh, Japan. So we had some kimono because we used to dance. So we had to bury all that. It was a shock, you know. I know my parents had a hard time. And so it was, they just gave us uh, three, four days to prepare to leave. Then they were looking for my father because we lived in front of the judo. And so they thought that my, my father was affiliated with someone from Japan. And so they thought that he was an enemy alien we were in Santa Anita for five months while they built these relocation centers inland. Santa Anita, the racetrack, we showered where the horses shower. So it, there was a ply board in the middle of the room. Half of the room was for women and the other half was for men. So there's no privacy at all. So we went to rural Arkansas from Santa Anita. We couldn't go out of camp because there's barbed wires around the camp and the soldiers in the guard towers with the, with the guns so that they assured the neighborhood surrounding the camps, don't worry, the Japanese won't escape because if they try to escape, we'll sh shoot them on the spot. We went to Heart Mountain. And so in order to go from Assembly Center to Heart Mountain, it's more like a concentration camp. If, if you try to sneak out anywhere, they'll just shoot at you. We were so ashamed of being in prison that we never talked about it. So my kids didn't know anything about evacuation or being in camp. I used to say, gee, I wish I was a blonde with blue eyes. I used to always uh, think of myself, gee, if I wasn't, you know, brown eyed and black hair, this wouldn't have happened. And I won't be discriminated against all the time. And then I thought about it after I grew up and I said, you know, I should be proud of what I am. And I'm happy to be what I am now. I was born in 1940. And that was during the Second World War. And the Japanese were discriminated with, and we were we looked like Japanese. They all associated Asians with Japan or China. And so there was a lot of prejudice against uh, any Asian at that time. Um, there was a lot of segregation with blacks and whites and being Chinese, it was difficult to tell sometimes where should we fit in. When my older brothers and sisters when they were growing up, they were not able to go to the schools in my hometown. They actually had to go to Mississippi to a Chinese school, which taught both Chinese and English. And then um, by the time I was in grade school, they allowed the Chinese to come to the white schools. And so we were part of the white population at that time, but it was a very small minority. And when I was young, like, uh, third, fourth, fifth grade, I was picked on a lot. I would ask some of the white girls for a date or a movie or something, and they always had an excuse. And I never, you know, had a, had a date accepted by a white 
a female while I was in high school or growing up. I, I, I see a number of parallels now. Um, unfortunately, I, a lot of the stories that, that, that I'm hearing recently from my father, um, I didn't hear growing up. So I understand that, that my grandfather's store was firebombed three or four times by the Klan. That, that stood out. Um, you know, he was a teen in, in, in the 50s. And you know, when, when I hear stories now about not being able to, to get a date or um, have a girlfriend at that age, um, I was a teen in the 80s, which is you know, more or less 30 years later. Um, it, was, it was the same. Um, but I recall one, one girl moved to, uh, to Little Rock from Tupelo, Mississippi. I had quite a, quite a big crush on her for many months, and finally I got up the courage to tell her I, I, I would like for us to go on a date or be boyfriend and girlfriend. Um, and I just recall Crystal Clear sitting on, on her front porch. She laughed and said, oh, that's so, that's so sweet, but I, I can't be your girlfriend. I said, well, well, why not? She said, because you're Chinese. You should know. Where I was, and this, this really crystallized when I went to public school in fifth grade, I got off the bus, um, which they, in the grand experiment of, of, of integration, um, they bust people across town. Um, I got off the bus and there was literally black and white. They saw me come off the bus and everyone's mouths just dropped. Um, needless to say, that day I got beaten up a number of times, um, got home, I was quite bloodied, my lunchbox was gone, and my mom asked me, what happened to you? I just said, I got beat up. She said, who did it? I said, everyone. Um, and it, it was like that. It was very hard to, to find my place. Um, but it, it definitely resonated, and, and I, I attribute that to being Asian, being Chinese, and growing up in the South. Good things you can learn in. For South Asians in the United that. States, we heard that 9-11 really impacted them in terms of their discrimination experiences. Um, we heard whether it was blatant in terms of um, them being stopped at the airport by a TSA officer or being secondarily screened when they come back to the United States or also their businesses being vandalized, right? So it really has impacted them in many different ways or they're hearing other people, other family members or members of their community um, being just blatantly discriminated. If I talk about 9-11, I finished the work uh, about five o'clock and uh, that happened is like uh, about in the morning, eight o'clock, something like that. So I was on the phone actually with my wife. So back to the Pakistan. And when I heard about uh, these buildings, I feel really, really very bad. Uh, I was driving after that, but is uh, a lot of people some say something, like go back to your country, and uh, sometimes the cursing, sometimes uh, like uh, say the bad words, but uh, I don't wanna try to give the answer because uh, some of my friends, uh, with the Argo, with the peoples, and um, they get in really trouble. They, they, they beat him, they slap them, and so that's why I don't try to involve uh, like uh, enough troubles. It was 9-11 uh, in the beginning. It was bad experience, but slowly it's going to be a much better, uh, and uh, this period is uh, really, really is uh, is same like same like before 9/11. The 9/11 happened, and that changed almost everything from there for for all of uh, I would say pretty much all of these Sikh Americans. The one thing uh, happened on 9/11 that once the the story unfolded, they were showing images of all these. Uh, uh, 
Al Qaeda people and you know Afghan uh, th those uh, terrorists, and they were all generally in turbans and long beards, and people were not able to differentiate that what is the difference between you know them and the, these people who are walking around here in our neighborhoods. Uh, so so for six years, uh, the the history had been there because this this kind of backlash, what what was building up on the day was very concerning because uh, we had lived through this whole uh, just, you know, at that time, uh, 20 some years before only that, uh, when uh, the Prime Minister of India, Indira Gandhi at the time was assassinated by one of our Sikh bodyguards. So we had that kind of built up in our mind that uh, all of a sudden, the Hindu majority country, you know, uh, people were, the Sikhs were dragged to the streets, uh, burnt alive, killed and by mobs and uh, women raped. And, you know, the, all this chaos happened within a few hours of that whole thing. So we were in that panic mode that, oh my God, this is going to happen all over again here. Well, first few weeks, it, it was like that because we were hearing incidents uh, almost every day, every, every other place. And uh, especially the the situation, the environment around us were like all the young kids going to school, uh, you know, wearing turbans or some kind of small head covering, uh, were hearing slurs like, hey, Osama, terrorist, you know, go back home kind of things. And the, this was all over in the campuses and in, in, on the streets. The, the, the one thing I want to really emphasize on that, uh, yes, I mean, we, we came from a different country, so we might not have felt that 100% of that pain, you know, what, what a person who was born American here would feel. And even though they are sick Americans, the kids felt the very same pain that, you know, this our country was under attack. And they were living through this dilemma that, okay, we are being treated as like we are the enemies itself within our own country and we were responsible for this kind of loss. This is our country. We love it the very same way. We are patriots and we are feeling the very same pain. We are sad just like you are. And now we are being picked upon and considered as enemies or we are responsible for this thing. But that, that you know, whole feeling itself, I think led to a lot of activism as well from those kids because I now I, 15, 20 years later see those kids being grown up into that that role that they are taking this on head on, uh, this hate and, uh, you know, this whole dilemma and highlighting it that hate shouldn't exist in our communities. Discrimination is something that's really not new for many of participants. They have experienced it for their entire life. So even things like go back to your country, it's a comment they heard over and over again. And they have different responses to it. For some of them, they are so common to it, they don't think it should really impact their mood. So they just don't ignore it, think that person was just ignorant. I do belong, this is my home, and they just brush it off. For some other people, they might take it more seriously because it really rocks the core of the identity and they want to speak up for themselves and they want to say, hey, no, I do belong here. I was born here. This is my country. In the past, I was embarrassed to fully say like Chinese American people would be like, where are you from? And then you say like, I'm from here. I'm from America. Where are you from? New York? No, like really, where are you really from? Okay, fine. Like China, like that. I'm Chinese. Like, is that the question that like you were trying to get at or whatever? Um, it feels like it's important to just like straight up say like Chinese American from like the first um, the first time somebody asks or like somebody's like curious. Um, so my parents they immigrated from China here, and I think my dad was around eighteen and my mom was probably seventeen, and then they met when they were over here. We moved from Coney Island to Staten Island, and when I started, it was just kind of a really an unwelcoming environment from um, pretty much like everybody left and right. Uh, it would be like the students and my neighbors. And um, it was just a complete like culture shock and things were like very different um, from the way that we were used to from like, you know, um, from Coney Island and in Brooklyn. Um, it was a lot less diverse and we didn't see many people that like looked like us. I was one of two other Asians um, in the whole like grade. I think that I didn't see anybody else around. Like we had our house egged and um, we had like hate mail pretty much uh, pieces of paper put in our mailbox that like said, go back to Korea and things like that. Um, little things like that just made us 
not really like living in Staten Island and not really like going to school in Staten Island. Um, so we asked my parents to move us back as soon as, just after the one year that we were there. Đối với cái đời sống ở đây thì uh, um, tôi nghĩ rằng mình sống sao mà mình cảm thấy rằng mình được hạnh phúc và mình cũng muốn share cái sự hạnh phúc và thành công đó đối với tất cả mọi cộng đồng um, phải bước qua khó khăn thì mới nghĩ rằng mình mới có thể đạt được những gì mình mong muốn. Uh. America gave me a lot of things. Believe me, uh, that's not a joke because uh, America maybe complete the dreams for many many peoples i'm actually american pakistanis i started approaching this as typical social science topic and i noticed that there is this sense of responsibility of doing it right and being an Asian person who shares some of the similar experience as what our focus group participants shared, and then feeling that there is a responsibility on my shoulder of, you know, letting their voice to be heard in a broader broader group, in a broader platform, so that those are not just stories that they share to us and the journey ends there, but we can amplify it, inviting more people to stand up and then share Their stories, some might be similar to what we presented from a focus group study, some might be unique to them, but it's about letting um, the society understand what it really means to be Asian in America. In terms of what it means for Asian Americans to be American, even though Asian Americans are trying to navigate through their identity, you know, the first, the foreign born are trying to struggle through language, are trying to understand, you know, learn what does it mean to be in America, what does it mean to be them in America. For the U.S. born, they're trying to understand their identity, may have conflicts, trying to navigate what it means to be American and also part of their parents' heritage. Even with these challenges, these challenges of discrimination, the challenges of trying to find who they are in America, I think that's what we heard, that what does it mean to be Asian in America is that struggle, it's that opportunity, it's that hope, and it's also that pride of being from where they left, what they're doing now, and in what they're creating themselves for the future. 